Good day, everybody. Uh, I'm super happy to be here. Uh, super honored, slightly perplexed, uh, um, but mostly honored. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about fat beat sensors. Uh, they have been mentioned uh, a little bit before. Um, diffusion, tensor, uh, diffusion tensor distribution is not so much, but uh, for an overview, uh, I'm just going to go over quickly, just lay the sort of background. So uh, it might sound like some of the stuff we've already uh, spoken about, but some of the fundamental shortcomings of what I will call conventional diffusion encoding. We'll get into what fat B tensors are and how they can access a new dimension uh, of diffusion MRI. Uh, a little bit about how we like to look at heterogeneous tissue with diffusion tensor distributions, and in the end, I'll show you some uh, examples from tumor tissue uh, from in vivo measurements. So let's ground ourselves in something that most of us are, uh, are familiar with, diffusion tensor imaging. It gives us diffusion anisotropy, uh, estimated usually in terms of the fractional anisotropy. And that is the uh, anisotropy of diffusion on a voxel scale. And um, if we are looking at tissue which we are familiar with, uh, we might say that if we have coherent tissue, which also has some reason to generate this anisotropy, we get a high uh, FA, and then in some tissues we get a low FA, either due to uh, orientation dispersion or maybe there is a lack of anisotropic domains uh, uh, all, uh, all around. So in this map that we see here of a brain, in all the parts which we recognize as white matter, we might say, well, this is coherent white matter here uh, in the middle, while these dark uh, crossing regions are due to crossing and orientation dispersion. So the problem, of course, becomes uh, uh, more evident when we're looking in tissue where we do not know what is there. So, uh, is, uh, so the FA is usually reduced in tumors. Um, uh, but we can't really say, is it situation A, we, where we have mostly spherical cells, uh, uh, that's why the tumor is uh, isotropic, or is it because we have these elongated cells which are just dis very disordered? So both of them can be uh, they're equally plausible, uh, but we can't really say why the FA is low. Um, <clears throat> and so to help us think about these things, uh, we can think of heterogeneous tissue in terms of the uh, distribution of diffusion tensors. So we're not throwing away the diffusion tensor entirely. We're, we're just replacing the content of a single voxel, not, with, uh, not modeling it with one diffusion tensor, but rather a whole distribution of them. So each one of these little uh, glyphs here uh, uh, represent a part, uh, some coherent part of tissue, and all of them together represent the content of a single voxel. And so the graphical language uh, here would be that larger spherical tensors represent loose tissue where the diffusivity is isotropic and fast. Uh, smaller uh, tensors, uh, of course, rep represent some, some uh, more hindered diffusion in dense tissue, for example. And then uh, uh, the other axis, of course, is anisotropy, so we have these elongated tensors. And so we can uh, sort of explain uh, both diffusivity and anisotropy with, uh, with these types of glyphs and, and models. So again, if we look back to the problem we had from the beginning with the, with the tumor, uh, we have these uh, three uh, cases which, of course, all map onto the same diffusion tensor. So they can be constructed to look exactly the same. And this is a problem, and we'd like to solve it. Some of the solutions that, that have been uh, presented or suggested have to do with collecting higher B values, multiple B values, a lot of directions, and the approaches might involve an extension of the model itself. Uh, it might be spherical deconvolution. It might be naughty, where we introduce uh, uh, or yeah, where, in, where constraints are introduced. But I'd like to argue that none of these solutions uh, uh, really uh, can do anything about the very fundamental limitation of uh, conventional uh, one-dimensional linear encoding. For example, to, to make this very, uh, I, I hope, easy to understand is, is this case where we have either isotropic tissue where all of the domains inside are exactly uh, identical. Uh, or isotropic heterogeneous tissue, uh, where there are some parts which are very uh, hindered and some which are looser and, and faster, and some, uh, and some uh, uh, tissue here where we have randomly oriented anisotropic structures. So if we use multiple B values, in the first case we get perfect mono exponential signal in some range of B values, uh, and in the other case we have this curvature. So we have some initial slope, which is the same, and some curvature. So immediately we can distinguish these two. It's easy. So one of them is homogeneous, the other one is heterogeneous. But of course, here is uh, uh, the problem. 
these two uh, uh, situations can be designed uh, to exhibit the exact same signal. So there is no model in the world that can actually tell you which one is which without any prior information. How do we solve this? Oh, oh yeah, so again, this is a fundamental limitation of conventional encoding. And conventional encoding in this case would be uh, linear encoding, uh, such as uh, the single PFG or statistical Tanner experiment, for example. These are exactly the same. And we solve it by uh, introducing multi-dimensional encoding. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Um, here, for example, we can combine both one-dimensional linear encoding along a single direction at a time with, for example, uh, Q-vector magic angle spinning, which produces uh, spherical encoding. So these are two types of encoding, one that only shoots in one direction and one which encodes the signal equally in all directions. And this is the first case. You'll remember it. We get this uh, signal curve uh, in this uh, isotropic heterogeneous tissue. We can see that the linear and the spherical uh, signal, if you will, so encoded with linear and spherical B tensors, they overlap. But in the uh, randomly oriented anisotropic domains, they diverge. So, so this already phenomenologically is a way to tell these two th systems apart. Uh, I'd like to spend a couple of minutes of just explaining why this is. In this super distinguished audience, I mean, maybe I'm, I'm completely uh, uh, over explaining this, but I'd like to spend a couple of minutes just saying why uh, these differences appear. Let us assume first that we're using linear encoding. In the isotropic case, each little diffusion tensor, micro tensor, if you will, will contribute to the distribution of diffusion coefficients that we see uh, in the sample with some diffusivity. So some of these tensors are big, so they contribute some fast diffusivity. Some of them are small, so it's a low diffusivity and everything in between. And we have this distribution of diffusion coefficients. If we're looking at anything which has multiple diffusion coefficients at the, in the same volume, we will get a non-mono exponential signal. And this is, this is it right here. So the initial slope of this will, of course, uh, uh, have to do with the expected value of the di distribution of diffusion coefficients. And the curvature will have to do with its variance, at least in some interval. These uh, two uh, parameters are enough to explain this. OK, so why do we get the exact same signal in this randomly oriented anisotropic case? Well, some of the microtensors will be aligned in parallel with the encoding, with the linear encoding. So they will appear as domains which have fast diffusivity. Some of them will be aligned perpendicular. So they will report or contribute some low diffusivity. And of course, all of the other directions will also contribute to some intermediate case. Um, I guess I've spent too much time on this, but I'll, I'll, I'll plow on. <laughs> So, uh, so these two uh, distributions have, have the same uh, uh, expected value and variance, so they uh, contribute the same um, signal. And this is what happens in spherical encoding. Uh, the spherical domains, isotropic domains, they are unaffected. It doesn't matter what, what encoding direction you use, you still get out the same contribution to this distribution of diffusion coefficients. Whereas each one of these randomly oriented domains will now contribute its local mean diffusivity. So they will lose their ability to contribute some different, direct, uh, different diffusivity depending on direction. So in effect, when we're using isotropic encoding, it removes the effects of anisotropy. And we go from a multi-Gaussian uh, multi, multi thing to a single Gaussian thing. So we only have one diffusivity. And of course, the signal now, instead of being curved, uh, it's, it's straight. So this is the fundamental thing that is going on here. Uh, this is another way of showing it. We can use any shape of the tensor. We only need to know the tensor's anisotropy or its shape, the encoding tensor's anisotropy or shape. And depending on what that, what that is, we get a different modulation depending on how much anisotropy is in the sample. And so any time we have more than one of these tensors, we can plug it into these, uh, th this simple equation where we have the observed variance as a, uh, as a sum of, of the isotropic variance from isotropic components and some wait waiting times the anisotropic variance. OK, so everybody's on board there. This gives us access to a couple of cool parameters, uh, the first one being isotropic variance which is simply some, something that happens which brings, brings the tissue from this homogeneous state into this heterogeneous state. Uh, 
in isotropic terms. Uh, the anisotropic variance, which is just the simple difference between isotropic domains and anisotropic domains, and the order parameter, uh, which uh, just uh, describes the, the, yeah, well, the order of the tissue. And these, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, and these can all be described from the distri uh, distribution of diffusion tensors, uh, but we'll not dwell on, on these equations right now. And I'll show you some parameter maps of, of these things uh, in, a, in a little second. But I'll first like to mention that these fat B tensors, so in really anything beyond the linear B tensor have existed for a while, right? So it, it began in 65 with Stasco and Tanner. Uh, we have a uh, uh, up to rank one B tensor. Uh, then came in the 1990s Cori with the double diffusion uh, encoding experiment. We have a rank up to two tensor. Uh, and um, Mori and Vensail, uh, as well as uh, Wang, uh, used these spherical B tensors to, to get at fast uh, imaging of uh, the mean diffusivity. However, we do it in a slightly different way. So we throw away the concept of only using trapezoids. We don't care about that. And we use so-called arbitrary gradient waveforms. We don't really care about what happens in gradient space, but rather what happens in Q, uh, in Q space. So it does require a slight modification to, to the imaging sequence, of course. But the, the benefit is that we can now explore the entire space of these B tensors. We can go from sticks to plates to spheres to anything in between. And I guess this, this is the B-tensor trinity now. <clears throat> um, in practice, it looks like this. So this is actually one of the waveforms that we, uh, that we use. It's, it's an optimized uh, waveform to demand as little time as possible so we can minimize the echo time. That gives a signal, of course. So for a B value of 2,000, we, we, demand, uh, we require about 70 to 90 milliseconds echo time at 80 millitesla per meter. And we've done these experiments at the connectome scanner at Prismas, but maybe more interesting, we've also used them at 1.5 Tesla systems with gradients as weak as 33 millitesla per uh, uh, meter gradients. So as you can see here, this is uh, uh, just repeating itself. Here we have the gradient waveform. Uh, this would fit into a spin echo. So we have the excitation before here. We have the refocusing uh, here while the gradients are turned off. And then we continue uh, encoding afterwards. We have this uh, uh, gradient trajectory, the Q trajectory, and we can see here how the B tensor uh, sort of grows uh, during the time. And this one is specifically isotropic. So now for some parameter maps. These are um, maps uh, acquired at a Prisma system in about eight minutes, so it's full brain coverage in two to four millimeters resolution. So these looks these look perfectly fine. Uh, uh, and we can see here that when we produce, for example, an FA map, we can see that it, um, it's, it's really just a, a combined effect of the actual underlying anisotropy, which we described with the microscopic fractional anisotropy, or microFA, times, uh, almost at least, it's not exactly mathematically correct, but almost exactly uh, uh, just uh, convolved by the or, uh, order parameter. And you can see there's a striking resemblance between the fractional anisotropy and the order parameter. So this sort of shows us that the FA actually shows us order rather than anisotropy first. Uh, we can also see that there's a better uh, sort of relation or, or the, the micro FA map looks, looks much more like a, a, a more, more morphological map of the white matter as we would expect. Going on, we can also separate these two types of variants, as I said before, which we call diffusional variance decomposition. Um, the total variance uh, you will um, uh, sort of recognize as the mean kurtosis because that's exactly, uh, or they're extremely similar. Uh, but now we can separate them in, into two components and they're actually just, so the total kurtosis or the total uh, diffusional variance is just the sum of the anisotropic component uh, and the isotropic component. And you can see here that the anisotropic component appears mostly in the white matter as we would expect. Whereas the isotropic component is not zero uh, throughout, the, throughout the brain, but of course very high in regions where we have a mixture of tissue and, and water because they're the, the two types of tensors which are within the voxel are obviously very, very different. Um, so what is this for? Um, we tested this in, um, in tumors and I'd like to see, this is a very uh, instructive case we have a meningioma in the top row here and a glioma. And uh, I hope you can see this little ROI, which sort of 
uh, shows where, where the tumor is in the meningioma case, in the glioma case, it's fairly obvious. So we can see that the uh, uh, variance is uh, amplified or, or high in both of these tumors, but we can't really say why. We can't really say other than that, that they are heterogeneous. But if we use divide, we can see that there is a huge difference between these tumors. So the meningioma has a high anisotropic component and a low, and a low isotropic component, whereas the glioma is exactly the other way around. So from this measurement alone, we would expect that if we open up the brain and take out the tumor and look at the cells, we'd expect something anisotropic in the meningioma and not, no anisotropy in the glioma. And that's exactly what we observed. So these are actually uh, the samples from these tumors. And as you can see, this is a fibroblastic meningioma, which is very anisotropic in there. So we continued doing this. Uh, and so this is from the paper, which is actually featured in the back of the pamphlet, which is cool. Um, uh, so we wanted to validate this. Uh, so we looked at these parameters in multiple uh, uh, tumor patients. And the tumors were resected. And we looked at whole slide sort of uh, uh, samples of these tumors. So this, the, this is three millimeters down here. So these, these tumor, uh, tumors actually cover several uh, voxels, if you will. And so uh, these stainings now are digital stainings. We can see the structure anisotropy using uh, structure uh, tensor analysis. If we zoom in on the tissue, we can see that this is a very fibroblastic meningioma, for example. And we can see that the structure tensors in 2D are very anisotropic and not so anisotropic in the glioma. And so we correlate the microscopy to the DMRI, so independent ways of measuring sort of the same thing, and we see a beautiful correlation between the two. So it means that this anisotropic variance actually carries some information about that underlying tissue, which is very good. We continued, so, so uh, let, let me just say that this is very much like the things that Finsterbusch is doing and, and, and uh, Sunni Esposen and so on. So this is microscopic anisotropy in a sense. It's just one way of looking at it. But what has been slightly overlooked is the uh, uh, variance in isotropic components. I haven't seen people explore uh, that too much. So we wanted to take a look at that as well. And so the premise here is that if we think that the local uh, diffusivity in the tumor changes, it might be due to the local density of cells, for example. So here we correlated the isotropic variance to the variance of cell densities in the tumor. And as you can see here again, the meningioma is fairly flat with, uh, with respect to cell density. You can see we just uh, segmented out the uh, cell nuclei and uh, just calculated how many there were for a certain unit area. But in the glioma, it, it was very uh, much more uh, heterogeneous. So uh, uh, it's, it's reasonable to assume that there is some isotropic variance in this tissue. And again, the, the uh, correlation was fairly strong. So um, you could say that we've turned something which is, uh, for example, mean kurtosis and split it up, uh, split it up into two more uh, specific components. Uh, and I would argue that the initial interpretation of those parameters is completely statistical. But with some support of histology, we might, uh, we might say that we can interpret it more um, based on what we see in the tissue. In the future, I would like to see this happen. Uh, so this is some data from uh, both simulations. This has been done in simulations and in, in NMR, very powerful scanners. Um, and this is, a f instead of just looking at the uh, variance of isotropic components and uh, uh, just uh, microscopic anisotropy, uh, it can, it, we can actually recover the distribution of, um, if you will, the, the eigenvalues of whatever is in the tissue. So uh, we can separate uh, anisotropy and diffusivity, as well as the orientation of the tissues within. And this demands that we sample a lot of different shapes of the B tensor for multiple B values in multiple rotations of the B tensor. So this is future stuff, and I'd love to see it, of course, uh, done in vivo. Uh, and I'd like to say fairly on time that the take home here is that uh, fat B tensors unlock new dimensions in, in, in DMRI. And although it takes some effort to install them, when they're in, I think they can provide us with a wealth of new information. Uh, so this means that uh, we can sample th this entire triangle uh, of, uh, of uh, B tensors where uh, Stasekel and Tanner uh, started in 65 with the stick down here in the corner. Corey filled it up in 1990 with the plate. And of course, Mitra later sampled this entire bottom row here. Uh, and Maureen Vensile uh, came in with a, with a spherical tensor um, 
on top here, now we can uh, sample all of them, all of this space, instead of just being relegated to one of these corners. And by doing so, we can estimate the mean and variance and also the distribution. I'm happy uh, whoever it was that asked whether or not we can possibly recover only the, uh, yeah, Derek, of course, uh, only the average microscopic uh, anisotropy, or if we can actually see if there are multiple different microscopic anisotropies. So in the best case scenario, yes, we can. Uh, um, we can take a look at local uh, isotropic diffusivity, anisotropy, and orientation coherence. And also I put in here, uh, because uh, Gary asked, um, or Gary said something about this, we can also test model assumptions. So if, if we have a model, we fit it to our data, and it predicts that there is some amount of water, for example, in some tissue component, that actually tells us what the signal should look or we can actually uh, work it backwards. What, what should the signal look like when we use isotropic encoding? So we can use isotropic encoding to see if that actually fits our prediction. Uh, and so it might help us understand the models and maybe make them better. And with that, uh, super big thanks to Derek Jones for inviting me and to the organizers and to my colleagues. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, uh, all right, Vinny. <coughs> Thank you. Really, really nice uh, work. Uh, I have a question. Uh, we, we talked about um, uh, axon diameter. So now let's consider that you have a distribution of directions, that's what you've shown, but you have a uh, distribution of axon diameters as well. How will that translate in what, what you've done here? What, what will we see in this case, com compared to just a distribution of uh, isotropic uh, spheric cells? Uh, so, so the axes might be a different size, but with these uh, encoding times, I think we'll all just look as if their diffusivity and the uh, yeah, perpendicular direction would be zero. So, uh, uh, so this method does not uh, actually try to access the um, um, well, the effects of, of, of diffusion time. And the times are very long, so I think they will just shrink together to zero. Uh, over here, yeah, thanks. That was a fantastic talk. I have a kind of a technical question from an experimentalist point of view. The, um, those uh, gradient waveforms you use, how, how sensitive are your measurements to the performance of your gradient waveforms in terms of propagation delay errors or eddy currents or, or any, any source of gradient error? Okay, so I'd like to say that that is not entirely explored, and uh, that's a good thing because that means that we haven't had any super obvious issues. Uh, I've seen a bunch of things go wrong. I mean, scanners crashing, amplifiers, you know, dying on me. But from looking at the raw data, there is nothing to suggest that there is any uh, huge issue like that. Sorry. Yeah. So I was just wondering if you had to do something like that. Well, we've we've had to introduce some precautions. Uh, for example, balancing due to numerical errors uh, or numerical uh, precision. Uh, but the the point is that these waveforms are fairly uh, robust to to some uh, distortions. And uh, they don't seem to introduce a, a bunch of weird eddy currents or anything like that. If anything, they're actually slightly smoother and, and less, um, less problematic in that sense. Um, but there, there are some heating issues. There are peripheral nerve stimulation. All that stuff we have to take, take into account when we uh, do these experiments. Here, okay. I'm here. Um, a beautiful talk. Um, so, questions about the variance. So, you know, you know, in a statistical sense, if you have a multimodal distribution, yeah, um, having say two delta function, so the variance become ill-defined. Well, not ill-defined, so, but hard to interpret. I would say it's still that's the same thing. It's, yes. <laughs> it's still it's still well-defined. In my book. Yeah. <clears throat> so, in that sense, uh, interpreting variance becomes extremely hard because. Um, we, can't, we, we, we say that we know that the distribution that is underlying this whole thing has a variance, but we say nothing about its shape. So that's where this, uh, if we can actually invert, uh, invert the data, 
we can actually take a look at the distribution as it looks. But, but the, the, there is obvious, obvious issues with that, as everybody will know who, who tried to do it. Um, but yeah, I, I can't tell you more than we're trying to a approach it with a statistical mind, at least I try to. So if you tell me that the variance is high, I can definitely tell you that something is heterogeneous. Whether or not it's two types of cells or 10 different cells with different uh, distributions of diffusivities, I cannot tell you. And I would recommend people not to tell anybody that they know these things. So presupposing a certain kind of element in the tissue is sometimes damaging because then you sort of suppose that if I get a fraction of 30% of that thing, then that must exist. But it doesn't have to.